Jesus, you are our merciful. You are our faithful high priest. And we thank you that that you sanctified us by your blood. We thank you that you lifted us up by your compassion and your mercy. We thank you that you have made us alive. And Jesus, this morning, we thank you that you are the king that is set on the holy hill of Zion above the new Jerusalem. And you will soon return to manifest your authority here on the earth. You will soon return to wash Israel of all of her sins and all of her iniquities. You will soon return to lead the nations in the knowledge of God and discipleship and the word of the Lord. You will soon return and give us resurrected bodies that would not struggle with temptation or sin. You will soon return with fire in your eyes and with light shining from your face that will light up the world. And we will truly see the light of the world as he rightly is. Jesus, we ask you right now that you would pour out your Holy Spirit in this place. We ask you for a fresh touch. We ask you for a fresh awakening of our spirit. We ask you, God, for fresh anointing. We ask you, God, for fresh life that flows from the vine. Fill us with the life that is that is in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come and be the spirit of revelation. Come and enlighten our eyes this morning. The eyes of our heart, that we would see him rightly. That hope would be grasped again that we would know what he feels about us again that we would experience his power again in any way that we need help jesus you said that you came to help the offspring of abraham and you can rightly help because you lived as a man tempted in every way but did not give him, give yourself to sin and you were merciful and faithful to help human beings to live righteously, to be sanctified, to be set apart. And you sent the helper. Holy Spirit, we just acknowledge you. We invite you. We wait on you. We love you this morning. We bless your name. We bless your name. Thank you, God.
Let's just sing that with our voices. And heart the herald angels see glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful, O oh, ye nations rise. Join the tribe of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the hell angels sing glory to the new. of your death you've opened up a door that men no more should die but to rule and reign with you forever so we thank you for your mercy we bless your name this morning it's only one strong enough to save there's only one who overcame the grave there's only
Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. The Omnipotent. The Omnipotent. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. He is radiant. He is radiant. The Almighty God. He's Counselor. He is Counselor. He is Counselor. He is Mighty God. He is Mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. The Omnipotent. The Omnipotent. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. He is radiant. He is radiant. The Almighty God. Oh. I just want to read that verse. This comes from Isaiah chapter 9. It's a very famous passage around Christmas time. I think even Andrew might preach from it a little bit this morning. But if you have your Bible and if you want to turn there just for a second, let's just read Isaiah chapter 9. It says in verse 1, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter days, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Now Matthew quotes this verse in Matthew 4, when Jesus began his earthly ministry in Capernaum. And it says this, verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And skipping to verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government, that means the throne of David, the prophesied kingdom of David, will rest upon his shoulders. And then the prophet Isaiah gives a human baby the names of God. It says this, to the child for us that is born, to the son for us that is given, his name is Wonderful Counselor. His name is Mighty God. His name is the Everlasting Father. And his name is the Prince that will bring all peace to all the world. Eternal shalom for every nation of the earth. And Lord, we thank you that it doesn't stop there. Of the increase of this child, of this son, of the increase of his government, and of the increase of his peace, there's never going to be an end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, he will establish it and he will uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And then just as a stamp of eternal security that this verse is going to come about, the Lord says, the zeal of the very Lord of hosts will accomplish everything we just read. Let's just stand to our feet. Lord, we thank you. You are the sun given. You are the light of the nations. For the nations walk in darkness, but you have invited them to walk in the light of your face. Lord, we thank you. And we agree with this testimony of Scripture. Your name is Wonderful Counselor. We lean into you today as the Wonderful Counselor. We lean into your name as the Mighty God. Lord, we ask you to release your might right now, even this morning. Release your power in our city. Release our, your power in our state. Release your power in our nation. You are the mighty God and we ask for great deliverance with outstretched arm and with a mighty hand. You deliver your people. You came 
to abolish death. You came to destroy the evil one, and you came to deliver your people. Lord, we say you are the everlasting Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we say you are the Prince of Peace. Lord, we say let peace be multiplied in this season. Let shalom with God and with man be multiplied in this season. You are the one who brings peace. As Genesis 49 says, you are the lion of the tribe of Judah and you bring peace to all the nations. So we ask you to do this. Let's sing his counsel. He is counselor. He is counselor. He is mighty God. He is mighty God. Prince of Peace, the Omnipotent, the Omnipotent. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. He is radiant. He is radiant. Wonderful Counselor 
had seen it upon the throne Oh, holy is the Lamb who seated it upon the throne Oh, burn the scroll nothing we can do to earn the like healing or try to get healing but there we hear your steps we feel your kingdom Jesus you're taking over treasures and crowds down at your feet honor and fame only belong to you you are before everything, grasping it all together.
giving praise to him and him alone. There's no other like the Lord. Cause every other God is an idol who cannot see, cannot hear. There is one true living God. There is one true living God. And every other God is an idol who cannot see, cannot one true living God There is one true living God Cause every other God is an idol Who cannot see, cannot hear There is one true living God There is one true living God Cause every other God is an idol Who cannot see, cannot hear There is one true
before we end this time of worship, I'm going to ask just everyone to stand up, and we're going to just enter right back in for just a moment here. And I just felt there's something powerful as we just fully set our gaze. I know some of you, it, it may be difficult to stand up. I, that's fine. I'm not. But if you can stand up, stand up, because I just feel there's an engagement right now into the presence of the Lord. We don't just worship for an hour just to, to kind of delay things. We worship to set our hearts upon Jesus because as we, as we behold him, there's something that shifts in us to become more like him. And he empowers us by his spirit, but there, there's this place of worship and honor and glory to him that positions us on the earth for what he has for us in this very time. I want to read this. We were in this this morning in the pre-service prayer. I'm going to read it from a, a, a translation that you might not have heard before. Um, it's it's, it's uh, Psalm 8, and it says this. It says, Yahweh, our sovereign God, your glory streams from heavens above, filling the earth with the majesty of your name. People everywhere see your splendor. You have built a stronghold, listen to this, by the songs of children. Strength rises up with the chorus of infants. Let me just read that again. <laughs> you have built a stronghold by the songs of children and strength rises up with the chorus of infants. This kind of praise has power to shut Satan's mouth. Childlike worship will silence the madness of those who oppose you. It doesn't say childish worship. It says childlike worship. As we were worshiping, I don't know if you saw just some of the kids and some of the older kids <laughs> up here just with flags, just worshiping. But there's something so precious. Jesus says this. He says, unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There's something about... If sometimes we just, we're, we're caught up in the heaviness of life so much that that we can't even like just enter in into the fullness of what he has and and it's like we're carrying all this stuff with us and he just says let it go and run into my arms and begin to worship me with that childlike worship and it says this silence is the madness <laughs> anyone need the, si the the madness silenced right now so just gonna read this part again sometimes it you know you know why advertisements like it takes like they do it once they do it again you have to hear it like a number of times before it kind of sinks in but just I'm gonna read this part again you have built a stronghold by the songs of children strength rises with the chorus of infants this kind of praise has power to shut Satan's mouth Childlike worship will silence the madness of those who oppose you. And then it says this, look at the splendor of your skies. Your creative genius glowing in the heavens. When I gaze at your moon and your stars mounted like jewels in their settings, I know you are the fascinating artist who fashioned it all. But I have to ask this question. Why would you bother with puny mortal man? It's a good question. This is God of the universe. He's the one who like created all things and, and he's like, why us? He says, or why do you care about human beings? Yet, says what honor you have given to men and women, <laughs> to mankind is what he's saying. What honor you have given to mankind.
created only a little lower than Elohim, crowned with glory and magnificence. You have delegated to us rulership over all that you have made with everything under our authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. The key is image bearers. How do we become image bearers? Is we behold him, it says when we behold him, when we worship him, when we look to him, it says we become like him. By the, by the Holy Spirit, it's this from glory to glory, there is a transformation of our lives to look more like Him, to becoming more like Him. It's, it's this place of pride being removed and, and that place of humility that we say, God, it's only in you. Jesus, it's only because of you. And so as we worship you, Lord, you set your spirit on the inside of us. You move us. You give us authority. You say you give us the keys to the kingdom. everything under our authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. All the created order and every living thing of the earth, sky, and sea, the wildest beasts, and all that move in the path of the sea, everything is in submission to Adam's sons. That would be us. Yahweh, our sovereign God, your glory streams from the heavens above, filling the earth with the majesty of your name. And people everywhere see your splendor. So I just want to go back into this song. And can we just worship God? Can we worship Jesus, the one who has come in the image of the invisible God, who we can actually see the one who has revealed all things, who has become wisdom and power, who has become understanding for us, that without it, he's become the, it was the mystery that has been revealed to the earth, love, that not, no one understood even what love was until he came to the earth. He said, this is what love is, that Jesus Christ would come and give of his life. Lord, I thank you that you were revealed, you're revealing you have revealed and you are revealing yourself through Christ by the Holy Spirit. It says the Holy Spirit now comes to reveal all things, to give us all things, that, that he reveals Christ in and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. All through Scripture, we see the Holy Spirit actually reveals Jesus. And he does it through people. He does it through revealing the Word to us but he puts his spirit within us that we become the very image bearers of Christ. And it comes from, I just, back to the grounding of this, it comes from that place of worship. So Lord, we stand before you today. Lord, to honor you, to glorify you, Jesus. It is from you that all things are, have existence. All things are from you, all things are for you, all things are to you. To you be the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Lord, we give you glory right now. We worship you. Would you just give him glory? Would you just worship him right now?
pre-service prayer we, we were praying and the Lord showed me that without vision the people will perish and he said it's not about a destination it's about the journey and the pieces that lie in between and so then during worship as uh, I just kept seeing this highway and the highway had all these cars on it and they were all changing lanes and they were doing their thing and I said Lord what is that and he said holiness is not a destination. And he took me to Isaiah 35, verse 8. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The highway of holiness, that is. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in his ways. Wicked fools will not go about on it. So, Lord, I thank you. Lord, your word says that it's a highway. You never said that the highway led anywhere. You just said it's the highway of holiness. So it is about the journey, journey Lord, and the holiness, Lord, your holiness, your glory falling in, 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 uh, upon the earth and in doing the earth in glory, Lord. Take us to this place of holiness. So, Lord, I thank you that every single one of us and those online, Lord, would get in our lane and just drive. God, it's all about the journey. There's a lot to learn on the journey. Even when you're learning to drive, <laughs> right? It's not about stopping at the destination. You're learning all about how to switch lanes and how to turn your blinker on and how to do all these different things as you drive there. There's no learning once you, once you arrive. Lord, we've never arrived, and I thank you, God, that the mindset and that, that paradigm shift would come right now, that the holiness is a highway and the highway doesn't end, and it's an eternal highway. And we get on it, Lord. And through you and through a sanctifying highway, Lord, we become holy. So, God, we thank you for that. You that is holy. You that lives in us and makes us holy, Lord. Through your righteousness, Christ. Amen. Sure. Jesus, we just look to you. We thank you. You're the lamb that was slain. That highway, that highway is Jesus. He is the highway. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. 
Jesus is the highway. He's the only way. <laughs> he is Yahweh. <laughs> he is the way. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Before we just transition, I just felt there's one thing I want to just release. Uh, the uh, I felt like that there's just a, an opportunity for healing in the room. And, and the beauty of Jesus is he just, he comes to reveal himself in so many ways. And, and so if... It, it's because of his love. And there's nothing that we can do to earn. It, <laughs> there's nothing we can do to earn the, like healing or try to get healing. But there is a part that we play. And if, if I just want you to see this and realize like sometimes we go, well, if he wants to heal, he's going to he'll heal. Well, I think there's so many people around the world that we see that there's not healing. Healing doesn't just like happen. It actually requires a partnership. It requires a connection between heaven and earth. And we are that connection. Now, without him, there is no healing. But the, the way I, I actually, my, my dad's used this before. Like, it's this, we're like battery cables. And uh, if you ever try to, to jump a car that may be dead, if you just take a pair of battery cables, no matter how beautiful they look or whatever they are, if you hook battery cables up to a car, it is not going to start that car. The only way that's going to work is when you take the other end of the battery cables and you hook them up to a power source. And we are like battery cables. If we're not hooked up to the power source, we're worthless in the sense of uh, you can't heal a flea. But as we connect to the power source, as we are, as we are ambassadors of Christ and image bearers of Him, by the power of the Holy Spirit that moves in and through us, there is actually a release of power as we align with heaven and we bring heaven to earth, the very thing that Jesus tells us to pray, on earth as it is in heaven, your will be done. That comes through us as the image bearers of Christ, as the ones who are the ambassadors and the ones who are the ministers of reconciliation to the world around us. Yesterday, just a fun little story, we had we had the food bank and um, there was this, this a lady that came. She may be here. I don't know. Uh, I'm not going to embarrass her or anything. But uh, but she uh, she she came in and it was the first time here. And I got to I got to share with her. There were some others with me, uh, and we were just we were just sharing Jesus. And uh, and her heart was stirred. She was in her car, and her heart was stirred, and she. She wanted that relationship with Jesus. And so we, we were going to just pray with her. And she was going to, to make that, uh, that step, to take that step to say, Jesus, I I'm going I'm to declare you as my Lord and Savior. I'm giving up my life that my life now become, is in you. And, and so we're about to do this. We're about to pray. And, and I just said, can I have your hand as we pray? And. She started to give me her hand, and then she's like, oh, I, I can't give you that one. Um, I'll give you this hand. And she gave me the other hand, and I said, well, what's wrong with your hand? Uh, she said, oh, I've, I have really bad neuropathy in my hand. Uh, it's pain. There's a lot of pain. I can't, can't grab anything, can't hold on to anything. And it's been, it's been this, this way for like six or seven years. She's been to all the doctors. They said it's something she's going to have for the rest of her life. She's on uh, these special medication for it, but um, it, it just makes her tired, and, and it doesn't actually take away the pain. It doesn't even fix the problem. It just, like, messes her up even more. And I just, as we were there, I just felt the love of Jesus come into that, into that car, 
she didn't understand healing. She didn't know, she didn't know Jesus as healer. She'd never experienced healing. And so even as I said, hey, I said, we're going to pray for your hand, and, it's, and Jesus is going to heal it. And, and it just didn't compute. And she's like, okay, that's fine. Like, <laughs> you can pray. Uh, but had no understanding of what Jesus can actually do. And as we just begin to pray in the car, all of a sudden she just stopped and she goes, what? She goes, what's happening? And she started to just move her hand around. She goes, what's, what's happening? I don't understand what's happening right now. Uh, like the, the pain is leaving and all of a sudden, like part of my hand now, I, there's no pain and I can, I can move my fingers. And, <laughs> but, but it wasn't like, you know, when we pray, it's like we, we kind of go, okay, yeah, it's starting, like the Lord's starting to heal. And she's like, I don't understand. What, how is this happening? What's happening right now? I've ne she had never not had this pain in the last six years. And, uh, and I said, well, the Lord's not done. And we just, sometimes, you know, we go, well, well, that was great. We prayed for that and good. But there's a pressing in to his goodness. There's a pressing into his love that we don't just stop when like, okay, we prayed once and we're good. No, we actually, we began to thank the Lord for what he was doing, and then we took it to the next level. We said, Lord, now finish the work. Finish what you've started. And she's like, well, it's still, I still feel it in my, in my, in my fingers, like in my, in my two little fingers. Uh, it's still there. It's the pain still there. And I said, well, we're, we're going to, we believe Jesus is the healer, the complete healer. He doesn't heal in part. And so we just kept praying and kept praying. And I don't know, maybe it was five minutes, ten, I don't know, somewhere in there. And she goes, it's all gone. All the pain's gone. There's nothing there. And she, but she was so blown away. She had to remind us over and over, no, you don't understand. She would say, you don't understand. There's no pain in my hand. And she's just crying. And we're crying. There's something about seeing the power of God move in somebody's life. And, and they're just, they're moved by the Holy Spirit. And, and so we're all just crying. And we're seeing just God tenderly touch this woman and show her how much she, that he loves her. And she jumps out of the car and she just gives a big hug and she's like, oh my gosh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I always want to be so cautious to go, yes, we play our small, our small part, but Jesus is our healer. He gets the glory. He's the one. Without him, there is no healing. And so, so she right there, as we just stood in that parking lot, she gave her life to Jesus. And, and there's something that happens when you experience his love in, in a powerful way. And she's like, I feel so light. And she's like, I, and she just began to pray. I was giving her a simple prayer to pray, and she just like exploded it to a whole other level. I'm like, she's, she's going after it in a whole other way. Why? because she just experienced something that blew her mind. The love of Jesus to go, we're mortal man. Why do you love us? Why, what are you doing that you would come down and you would actually touch us in the very place we are, in the moment that we're in, whatever struggle we're in, to say yes to this sweet woman who just needed a touch from the Lord and a healing Here's the beauty of it. If you read the story in John 4 of the woman at the well, Jesus encountered her in, a, in an amazing way. And I think sometimes we just kind of read through it so quickly, but he encountered her to where she went back and she began to tell everyone in the town, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one? It's the one. And the whole town comes out to meet Jesus. She went back, she went home, and she texted uh, someone in our church and said, she said, I'm telling the test, this testimony to everyone. She goes, I'm telling it to my kids. I'm telling it to my best friend. I'm telling it to my mom. She's telling this, this testimony about who this Jesus is that has just healed her from this neuropathy in her hand. And she said she was, she was uh, kneading dough and... Uh, and she said, like, something that she couldn't do, like, without a lot of pain and taking breaks. And she's like, and I took no breaks. There's no pain. 
Still, no pain. And I think just blown away. I, I, I say this because this is the God that we serve. This is Jesus who loves us so much that we don't have to carry around the infirmities, the sicknesses, the things that in life, we actually come to him and he's the healer. He's the one that heals. He's the one that restores. He's the one that sets free. He's the one that gives us the fullness of life. And then it's for the purpose that we would then be those that, that share this good news with others, that, that tell the testimony. I'm, I'm like, here's a woman. She just gave her life to Jesus. And within just a couple hours, she shared the gospel with four people. <laughs> There's something powerful about that. And I know that that's, it's, that was just the first day that this is going to go and be carried on. And let me tell you about this Jesus who healed me. She tried to, she tried to, to go other directions. She tried to have, like, yeah, she, she tried to get the healing in multiple different ways. It didn't work. Jesus was the healer. Here's the beauty. She had cried out to God three days before this and said, God, it, like not having, I mean, she was, she was working with, with psychics trying to get like healing and, and doing whatever she could. She just, she's, she was searching, which is beautiful. Like I don't hold that against her in any way. But she cried out and she said, God, would you show me my destiny and my purpose. And three days later, she got to know her destiny and her purpose in life through Jesus. So I want to do this, and then we'll, we're going we're gonna to take it off, and I wanna, we're going to pray for... Um, you're healed right now. Wow. Okay. So we already have a healing right here in the hands. Was it in the hands? Okay. So hands totally healed? No pain? Pins and needles, all sorts of stuff, and it's gone. Everything's gone. Okay. The definition of when you say testimony it is, it means do it again. Do it again, Lord. So there's a there's a power in the testimony. So what was just released and then released right here again, it's, it's just, it, it kind of raises that faith level. Again, we don't just go, God, if you want to heal, you'll do it. No, there is, a, there is a pressing in. There is an engaging with him. There is a tapping into heaven. There is a connection that has to be made. God has his power, but he uses us as the rusty battery cables. That's our part that we get to play. So here's what I want to do. If you need healing in any way. <laughs> like, is everybody going to stand up? <laughs> Whatever, we'll see. But if you need healing in any way, would you just stand up? So there's a lot of people right now. Now, if you're not standing up, you're the rusty battery cables. <laughs> And you're just going to lay hands on somebody else. And if you're standing next to someone, if you're already standing, you can lay hands on each other. Uh, and, and so just, but I want everyone to have a hand laid on them. Uh, there's, there's something important about the laying on of hands. And some people think, well, it has to be a pastor. It does not have to be a pastor. We're all rusty battery cables. It just has to be Jesus. Jesus has to be in the middle of it. If he's, he's, the, he's the source. He's the power. So there's... So over here, would you someone jump, jump back here and, and lay a hand on this lady right here? Right there. Anybody else that, that does not have a hand laid on them? Anyone else? Okay. If you see someone that's standing without a hand laid on them, lay a hand on them right now. And we're going to ask Jesus to come and just to release healing, whatever that is. And we're believing that the Lord's going to do it. Now, it didn't happen instantaneously with this woman. It, it took, it took a couple, 10 minutes. Now, sometimes it can take an hour. Sometimes, I mean, don't, don't say, well, it didn't happen with me. No, we're, we're pressing in and we're praying and we're believing that the Lord is doing something. And it's activating it right now. 
And so just begin to pray. Just begin to pray right now. It doesn't have to be an elegant prayer. It's a simple prayer. Jesus, <laughs> bring your healing. Jesus, come right now. It says hope deferred makes the heart sick and I just feel like there's a couple people that you've been like yeah I've been through this many times I just feel if you press in do not have the attitude that yeah this is just another prayer that we're praying take the attitude that today is the day that you're going to receive the healing that the Lord has for you so Lord we just release this right now just yeah just pray over the person pray over them right now Lord, I thank you that faith is rising in the room right now. Jesus, I thank you that there is healing right now in this room. Lord, we just say on earth as it is in heaven, we tap into your healing power right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for an outpouring of your spirit right now. Lord, that every person would be healed. One of the things as I was praying is I began to, I asked her, check your hand. And she began to check her hand. And at first there wasn't anything. And then all of a sudden she's like, oh, wait. Nope, there's like things have changed. Like the two fingers, like they're, they're better now. So there's something to just begin to check whatever it is. If you can check it, uh, just begin to check to see, to see if there's a shift, to see if something's changed. If there was pain, see if the pain's still there. It may still be there. See if it's the same pain or if it's lessened. And then just begin to pray again and begin to thank the Lord for complete healing. Just begin to press into it. Thank you, Jesus. It's all eyes on you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. you're checking and you've experienced if you're seeing something that has has shifted it may not be even a hundred percent but that something is significantly better that you're feeling like okay that's not how it was just two minutes ago I just want you to just put a hand up in the air I just want to see just put your hand up put your hands down if your hands are up <laughs> and you're just and you're just worshiping the Lord but yeah, so if there, okay, so we have one over here, one over here. Okay, we had one over here. Any other changes? Right here, one over here. Come on. Thank you, Lord, for healing right now. Thank you, Lord, for your healing right now. He's moving. He's healing. Lord, I thank you that people are receiving their healing all over the room right now. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the back pain, the, the, the lower vertebrae that are being healed right now. Lord, I thank you for the whatever the in the lower L5, L6. Is that the lower? I don't know. But I just felt like L5, L6. Lord, I just thank you for healing right now. In the left leg, Lord, I just thank you for your healing right now from the pain, the limp that's, that's now being healed. Lord, you're doing a work right now in this place. I thank you for hands being strengthened and healed right now in the name of Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for healing right here. She can walk. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for healing right now. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. He heals the lame. He heals the lame. Lord, I thank you for ears to hear right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, where there's been loss of hearing, I thank you for the restoring of hearing right now in Jesus' name. Restore in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wow. All right. We're going to continue just to press in. You can, we're going to move on with the service, but, but <laughs> we're going to believe the Lord is going to heal every area that, that we're... It's like something just shifted in the atmosphere. Something just shifted in your, in your life right now. So Jesus, we just give you thanks right now for healing. We thank you for what you've done. Yeah, just give the Lord a hand for the healing. We want to hear the testimonies. So I don't want to hear about it six months from now. Like, oh yeah, by the way, I got healed. Would you just let me know after the service or let one of the pastors know so we can just... We can share this. We can document it. We want to know what the Lord is doing. Yeah. Joshua, would you come up? Joshua Langman. And then, yes, I want to get my two brothers from uh, Mongolia. If, if you guys can come up. We have, we have some, yeah, would you guys just give these guys a hand? Um, I'm going to totally butcher the names, but Bage and... Sun, Suntra. Suntra. Yes. Uh, I just want you to hear quickly. These, uh, these men are uh, from Mongolia, and they're doing an amazing work right now in Mongolia. Uh, they're going around, and they're literally knocking on the doors of every home and sharing the gospel and going from town to town to town. And, and so... He's just going to share real quick, and then we're, gonna, we're just going to pray over them. But also, I just felt like there's an opportunity even. Here's the thing is we get to sow, uh, we get to sow into the kingdom. And, um, and so I just felt like this morning, even as we're taking the tithes and offerings this morning, there may be something that the Lord is just putting on your heart. Uh, what he was explaining in the back room as we were praying together, it takes about $500 to, to impact a city with Bibles, which when you think about it, or a town, like $500 to touch an entire town with, with Bibles. That is not much to, to touch the lives of so many people. And so I just felt if, if we, we want to just give into this, I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, just met them today, just met them this morning, and they have a ministry called Bless Mongolia. Uh, but but as we as we take the tithes and offerings, if you if you write just at the bottom, if, if it's a check, uh, just write uh, just write Mongolia on it, and uh, and if it's if you're doing it online, just put it in the memo. Just uh, just type in Mongolia, and then we're just gonna we're gonna bless them just with uh, with funds to go see the glory of God revealed in a nation that needs God so much in this time. So I'm just going to have them quickly share, and then we're going to just pray a blessing over them, and then I asked uh, Joshua to come up, who's on our board. He's going he's to pray over the tithes and offerings. So. Hello, the Rock Church family, right? Yeah, so my name is Abagi, and I want my uh, leader to introduce himself as well. Yeah, my name is Sansra. I so the this time uh, so uh, all the spirit so touched my heart this uh, this morning. Thank you for your prayer. Thank you for Astra doing this. So I was actually planning to read a passage when I found out I have an opportunity to share. But I, did, I didn't know what God was doing in the church, but I want to just read it quickly. So in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, right after Jesus was resurrected, he came to his 11 disciples. And he told his disciples, chapter 16, verse 15, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The one who has believed and has been baptized 
will be saved. But the one who has not believed will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who have believed in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out. Who went out? Disciples. And they went out and preached everywhere, everywhere, while the Lord walked with them and confirmed the word by the signs that followed. Amen? Jesus, what they have started, started kingdom of God on earth. I'm so thankful these 12 disciples, they went. And they went everywhere. And I'm so thankful that the gospel came to Mongolia in 1990. Before 1990, there were zero Christians in Mongolia because Mongolia was about 70-year-old communist nation. The borders were closed only one communist TV station, only one communist radio station. That's the only thing we have learned. But Mongolia opened in 1990, missionaries started coming. Why? I believe they obeyed this command to go into every world and preach the gospel to every creation. Amen? And I'm a fruit of a missionary. Missionaries came and I heard the gospel and I was discipled by missionary. And why when young people who trained in YWAM training school, on their outreach, they went to Sansra's hometown. He was in the most northern west remote town, and he heard the gospel, and his family became a believers. And then we both did discipleship training school with YWAM. Now we are full-time missionaries with Youth with a Mission in Mongolia. <laughs> gospel is being preached in Mongolia since 1990, and after 33 years, Mongolia is now about 1.4% Christian. But it's very small compared to 100%, right? <laughs> God says go and preach to every creature. So I just want to say as a Mongolian, we're so thankful to be here. And I want to say thank you, Brother Bob and uh, Sharon. And you know why? You know Angela Nevi? Do you know? She came to Mongolia as a missionary. Now she's serving with us in Mongolia. So we are so thankful that you already have someone from your church amongst us. So I want to say, Rock Church, thank you for sending a missionary to Mongolia. And so just to make a short story, God has spoken to Waiwa Mongolia to reach every home with the word of God. Give a Bible as a gift and proclaim the gospel. We have started the ministry in 2019. In the beginning, it was shocking. This morning I said, how do you reach every home in Mongolia? The question we had was, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? So just like that, we felt like one town at a time, we're going to send outreach teams, knock on every door, and share the gospel and give them a Bible. So 2019, we have started miracle after miracle. We were able to mobilize Mongolian people to go to to these towns as well as international outreach teams from YWAM and churches, youth, they're coming and helping us. So I want to just send, I just want to say Mongolia has 21 provinces and this year we are about to finish 16th province. <laughs> Amen? And God is reaching and Jesus being proclaimed. So next year we have five more provinces left to reach 21 provinces and we're inviting the Rock Church family Will you partner with us? Thank you very much. Would you guys just put your hands out? We're going to just pray over them right now. Okay. So in two days, they're, they're, they're going to Texas right now. They actually have to leave right from here uh, to go to Texas right now. And then um, in a couple days, they're going to Mongolia again. So, Lord, we just lift them up right now. I just felt this scripture over you guys as you're, as you're doing the work. It says this, 
This is Nehemiah, and it says, so the wall was completed on the 25th of Yulel in 52 days. It says, when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and they lost their confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Lord, I thank you that as they go back to Mongolia, and it seems like an extensive work, it seems like a lot of work to go into every home, but Lord, I thank you they play their small part, and then Holy Spirit, I thank you you play the big part. Lord, we pray for your empowering grace to come upon them, to accomplish things in ways that they could not do in and of themselves in their own abilities. The Lord never gives us tasks that we can do by ourselves. He gives us tasks that are impossible to do by ourselves, but with God, all things are possible. And so, Lord, we thank you for the all things. We thank you for, for what you've called them to do, and then you say, now you, you're going to need my Holy Spirit to accomplish it. Lord, we say, strengthen the work of their hands supernaturally strengthen the work of their hands. Lord, bring people alongside them, and I thank you, Lord, that this work, though it seems like it's extensive, Lord, that you're going to complete this in a supernatural way, in record timing, Lord, that they can move to the next task, the things that are ahead, and begin to establish the homes, establish the, the, the discipleship camps in, these, in each of these communities, that there will be a church. Lord, we just declare right now that there will be a church, an ecclesia, in every single town in Mongolia that every town in Mongolia will have a church because of the work that they're doing, because of the extensive work that is being done. And so, Lord, we thank you that we get to be a part of this, even just in, in sowing into this and to send them as they go back to complete this task that you have given them to do. We bless them. We bless, bless Mongolia in the work that they are doing in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. So I know this is totally impromptu, but yesterday God told me to get $500 out of the bank, and I thought it was for a friend. It's for you. Yeah. you Amen. <laughs> there it is. There's one town right there. Uh, Joshua, would you just release a blessing? Praise you, God. Um, just so grateful thinking about this, this past year and the way that God has led many of us through the year. And um, just, we, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for how you've led us through tough times and led us through amazing times. And I just pray right now for your, your grace to just relax from our own works, rest from our own works, enter into your rest, Disconnect from the busyness and all of the demands, the buy this, buy that, do this, do that demands. Just invite you, body, to, to pull back into Holy Spirit. And say, what Holy Spirit would you do right now? What would you have me do right now? Just disconnect our hearts from the the hold of things, the hold of, of money, the hold of expectations, all these things that, that pull on us. And even in this time of, of remembrance, this time of gratefulness for, for you and for your gift and for your son, Lord Jesus, just turn our eyes to you, look to you, what are you doing? I praise you for your gifts that you released even this morning. Let your blessing go forth from this place, God. Your blessing go forth to Mongolia. Your blessing go forth into our homes and into our families. May we be a blessing and may we touch family members and those that we, we see here in the next few weeks and I just pray for a rest and a peace and a confidence in you. The world may be at war, but we have peace in our hearts because of you.
In this grace and in this peace, Father, we, we give. We say, what would you have me give? How can I release myself from the hold? And even now, as, as there's an opportunity to give, that we would just rejoice in that. Praise you, Lord. You are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you give uh, Pastor Andrew a huge hand as he's going to come up and, and release the word. Thank you. Wow, it's hard to believe sometimes it's already this late into December. Next week is Christmas Eve and Christmas. Uh, we would love to invite you, your families, your friends, whoever will be with you celebrating or neighbors that won't necessarily be celebrating with you, but you know that you'd, you'd love to invite them. We'd love to invite you and, and those to our service uh, next week. We won't have our morning service. Instead, we're going to have an, an evening service. Uh, we'll have candle lighting and worship. The, the official service will be at 3 o'clock, uh, but we know many of you love to worship longer than, than what we can fit into a, a Christmas Eve service. So we're going to have some extra worship at the 2 o'clock hour, and then we'll We'll pause that at 2.45, welcome everyone, and do an official start at 3 p.m. So uh, depending on what your schedule allows and, and whether you're, you're hosting or whether you've got time to come and worship with us, join us either at 2 or at 3, and we look forward to, to spending that with you. And then if you've got uh, a young person or if you just love young people, please be praying. They're going on a, on a youth winter retreat that's going to happen uh, right after the new year, January 4th, 5th, and 6th. And so be praying for them. And, um, and then this is also your reminder, if you're like me and, and, and you tend to think, oh, I, I need to sign my kid up for that thing, uh, this is your reminder, sign your kid up for that thing. Uh, we've got about 12 spots left, is last I heard, and so those are going to fill up fast. We don't want anyone to miss it. Um, so this is your upper opportunity to visit the link and get them registered. Awesome. This morning, I, I want to share something that's been on my heart. Pastor Mike had begun talking about it a few weeks ago, talking about grace, and I want to just sort of build on that and then kind of see where the Lord takes it, but um, I, I want to, if you can, um, the first verse we're going to look at is in Romans chapter 3, but to help us, maybe even just to help me, uh, I think illustrations, stories, I think it helps me to get it. Sometimes I'll read the, I'll read the Bible. I actually... I did this this morning. Our, our church Bible reading plan has us in the book of Nahum. I read all three chapters. It's not a very big book. I read it and I thought, what did I read? <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not sure I understand Nahum. I don't know why we picked this one. Like, I don't know that I've ever heard someone preach out of Nahum. Um, it's just, and so I was like, I don't know. So I had to like Google some resources. I was like, what, what is this? Found a, a wonderful video. It explained so much. And I was like, oh, I get it now. And so there are times where the scriptures, you know, spirit of revelation, it jumps out at you. And then there's other times where you're like, I need someone else to help me unpack this a little bit. And so um, I want to share this morning in a way that I think will help us unpack a few things in the scriptures. And, and so if you'd let me, I, I want to tell you a little bit about my four-year-old. Frances is, uh, man, she's special. She is strong-willed. And she's intense, and she brings so much joy to Luna and, our, and my life. Um, but I believe the Lord made it that way so that we didn't get frustrated and, and give up parenting. Um, he, he makes some of the hardest ones the cutest. You know what I mean? Any parents in the room? And so Frances, uh, she's real strong-willed, really independent, likes to do things herself. About a month ago, our older daughter, Ryan Kate, she's in second grade, so she's learning reading and spelling, and she's getting pretty good. English is incredibly hard, so many rules. I had forgotten about them, because as you get older, you just sort of, well, this is the way we spell it, and I don't know, that's just how it is. But when you have a first and a second grader, and you're having to, like, re-articulate, okay, I know it does sound like it should be spelled that way, but it's not, you realize how many times you have to do that. So um, she's in that season of life, she's learning how to spell, she's doing really good, and, and Francis, our four-year-old's in the preschool here at the church, which, side note, is fantastic. If you've got uh, preschool age, toddler kids, um, director, Dr. Judy is doing a fantastic job with our, our little ones. 
And, um, and so she's learning letters, she's recognizing them and the sounds they make. And so Luna thought it'd be a great idea. Let's play a family game night and we'll break out Scrabble. And, um, and so we're really excited about it. So I talked with Francis, I said, Francis, I would love for you to be on my team to play Scrabble with us. Now, I wanna remind you, like just stressing these points. She's four, she can't spell, she's only learning how to recognize letters and the sounds they make. So she's not gonna be able to play Scrabble by any means. I know that, RK knows that, Luna knows that. Francis, I'm not sure if she knows that or not. She, she's so strong-willed, confident, and independent that I think she thinks I can do anything these other bigger people can do. And so I said, hey, I'd love for you to be on my team. We're gonna have a lot of fun playing a game tonight. And she said, no, Dad, I wanna do it on my own. <laughs> I said, okay, I, don't, I, don't, I think it'd be better if you were on my team. And in my head, I'm picturing like, RK can spell, Luna can spell, I can spell, but with Francis, I'm just gonna have to be like, hey, can you grab the C and put it here? And she's gonna recognize, oh, okay, I know what a C is. And I, that's how I'm picturing our, our involvement in the family game night's gonna go. But um, strong-willed and independent and beautiful and fun, but she's convinced, no, 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 I can do this. I'll play on my own team. I was like, okay. And so in that moment, I wasn't really sure, like, as a dad, is it better to, like, just, like, steamroller and be like, no, you have to be on my team, because that seems like that's going to end in an argument, or to let her try to spell things and get really frustrated and also end in an argument. And so I thought, I'm between a rock and a hard place. Let's just see how this plays out. Um, but sure enough, we get into it. Luna's spelling, Ryan Kate is spelling, I'm spelling, then it gets to Francis's turn, and it's like, all right, what word do you want to spell? And she's like, I, I don't know, she says something like, I want to spell dog, and it's like, you don't have any of those letters. Like, you can't, you can't do that, that's not how this game works. And, um, and so game night, like, it took a turn, and it didn't end well, and we were like, you know what, it's seven, let's all just put on our pajamas and go to bed early. Like, we're, we're exhausted from fighting with you, you're exhausted from not getting what you wanted, this thing that I thought was going to be a lot of fun took a, a terrible turn. And, and what I was seeing in those moments was that there are a lot of times where God calls us to something that is impossible for us to do. He says, hey, Andrew, I want you to, to play this game with me. And I say, okay, God, I'd love to play that game with you, but I want to play on a different team. Like, I want to be my own independent team. And he says, I don't think that's a good idea. And I say, no, 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 it's cool. you you do your thing and I'll do my thing and we'll, we'll do it and it'll be kind of together. We're at the dining table, you know, we're sitting together in the kitchen, but I, I want to do it myself. And God says, you, you really can't do it yourself. I love you, but this is impossible for you. And so let's take a look at, at some of these verses. Let's, oh, first I want to show you, I made a beautiful chart, very scientific. Jaden, just throw that up for him. Let us, let's show him. There's this, um, there's this bar I'm calling it the grace gap. If you're taking notes, you can write that down, the grace gap. Uh, next slide. There's this bar of God's calling. This is what God has called us to. This is a, a life of godliness, a life of righteousness. This is um, the individual call that you have to be a parent, um, your career, uh, the impact you have on the neighborhood that you live in, uh, ministering to your family and your friends and your coworkers. It's his calling on your life. And then there's our capabilities. And it only goes to about there. And whether you're really, really good at things or really, really bad at things, it seems that regardless, our capability really only gets us about that far. But then, and this is the fun part, God fills in the rest of the grace gap. He fills it in by his grace. And that's what we're gonna talk about most of this morning. We're gonna talk about that gap that God fills with his grace. When I was wanting to play with Francis and her be on my team, I know she can't spell. I was gonna do it for her. I still wanted her involvement. I, I easily could have played the game without her. It's not like I needed her to contribute to me, right? Like I wasn't gonna be like, how do I spell cat again? I know how to spell, she doesn't know how to spell, but I wanted to do it with her. It brings me joy as a father to play a game with my children. It brings joy as a father to partner with my kids to do things together, but I knew that she couldn't do it on her own. She had to do it with me, and that's the grace gap. So let's look at Romans chapter three. In Romans chapter three, Paul's reminding us of something that we're probably deeply acquainted with. It's our own shortcomings. Romans three, verse 23, he says, for everyone has sinned 
And we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of, all, from, from the penalty of our sins. So our best efforts fall short of his glory. His standard of, of glory and excellence is, is up high. And all of our work throughout the generations, there's no person that has been able to hit that, that high mark. And so instead, we have to throw ourselves on his grace to close the gap. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, We are all infected and impure with sin, and when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. So even on our best day, our best efforts, all of our, our good works, still don't quite touch his holiness. Not because they're bad, not because we're doing them wrong, although sometimes we've done the, the right thing the wrong way, right? But because his holiness is so much different than our, our goodness, right? His goodness is so much different than when we're being good. It, it's so much better. It's so much greater. And so there's always just this gap between where we can get and where he is, and it only gets filled by his grace. Ephesians Chapter 2, verse 8 says this. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. So we get uh, from our sinfulness to his holiness by grace. Right? We, we work. We, we, um, we live the godly life. We pray. We fast. We read our Bibles. We, we go to church. We worship. All of those things. But that doesn't get us there. That's just our efforts. That's just choosing to sit on God's lap and play the game with him. Everything else is, is the gap is closed by his grace. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, and, and I know we're flying through these, but there's a bunch of them here. Matthew 19, 26 says, Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is impossible. Everything is possible. He's talking about that gap. He says, you guys can't do it. All of it. It's just impossible. It says, but I'm going to close this gap by the power of grace. So we get from our inability to his ability by grace. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, but it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thought except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thought except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. So we get from our way of thinking to his way of thinking by his grace. It's only because he gave us his spirit that we can now think differently. All of our own rationality, all of our own wisdom, all of our own logic, it only gets us so high. But to get to his way of thinking, it's only by his grace. There's not enough books, podcasts, and sermons that will get us to where we can think like God. It is only by his grace and his Holy Spirit that we can have the thoughts of God, that we can see things from his perspective, that we can begin to understand his ways of doing things. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says, Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. All of our human efforts, all of it only gets us back into sin. It only gets us back into carnal living. But when we turn it over to God by his grace, by his Holy Spirit, he gets us to uh, things that please him. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. We get, our, we get from our power, our ability, to his power by his grace. Paul is writing about all the things he did. He was comparing himself to some other apostles, and he's like, I worked harder than all of them. And yet it wasn't really me working, it was God working through me. He was acknowledging that in his own efforts, all of his working would have left him burnt out and exhausted. It, it wouldn't have been enough. He, it wouldn't have accomplished much. It would have been just spinning his wheels, but not getting anywhere. But he said, but it wasn't just me that was working. It was God working in me. And by his grace, he did so much. Paul becomes like my hero in the Bible of like, man, 
wrote books of the Bible, like evangelized like entire regions and countries, like the dude was an all-star of all all-stars. And he says, but not I, but the grace of God with me. Second Timothy chapter two says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. He wasn't telling Timothy, hey, you need to wake up before the sunrise, you need to take an ice bath, you need to like work on productivity, you know, you need to listen to these like 10x engineers, you need to, you know, you need to um, kind of double and triple up, like when you're exercising, you also have to listen to a podcast. He wasn't pushing Timothy on a productivity increase. He was saying, be strong through the grace that God gives you. Now, I'm not directly knocking any of those things because I like each one of those. I think it's good to exercise. I think it's good to to, to uh, exercise your mind. I think it's good to read. I think it's good to, to listen to things. But all of that will only ever get us this far. All of our, our own efforts, all of our own work, all of our striving will only ever get us so far. If we're going to hit the calling that God has for us, it only gets us, we only get there by his grace. So, so Paul writing to Timothy said, be strong through the grace of that God gives you. Don't be strong in your own efforts. Don't be strong in your own might. Don't be strong in your own power. Be strong in the grace he gives you. So as I read all these, I begin to think, wow, I, I can't think like God without him. I can't live righteously like he calls me to without him. Uh, I can't be strong enough without him. I can't heal or save or do any of these things without him. And it makes me think this, The system is rigged, right? God has rigged the system from the beginning, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. He's called us to an impossible standard that we can't reach. I mean, have you guys read the Beatitudes? When when Jesus goes through the teaching in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and he says, you've heard it said this, but I say this. He, He gives them the law that was already impossible for people to fulfill, and then he says, but I say this. It says don't murder. I say don't even, don't even have hatred in your heart for someone. It says don't commit adultery. It says I say don't even look at lust with someone. He says, he's, he, each of these things, he raises, raises the bar on them, and I think, man, you took an impossible standard and you just raised it even higher. The only way we can do any of the things God calls us to do is by his grace. So there's this gap. And I think, God, that's, that's, not, that's not fair. You rigged the system. I'm always going to lose. But it's not that he wants us to lose, it's that he wants us to partner. He doesn't want us to get upset, God, this is impossible. He wants us to run to him and say, God, would you help me? So I I picked on Frances a little bit. She didn't want to play Scrabble with us, kind of ruined the family game night. But there's another time uh, that Frances is really quick to understand grace, and it's when she's doing chores. So the, each of the girls, like kind of as they grow, they, they pick up more and more household chores and learning to contribute and to work hard. Um, Frances right now, her chore is the recycle. So as we use a can or empty a gallon of milk or whatever, it kind of gets set next to the counter. And then when there's, you know, a few items there, it's like we remind her, hey, Frances, like time to take out the recycle. So she goes and she'll take out the recycle. And the first few times, she'd kind of like struggle with it. It was a lot. And I say a lot just because... Her whole torso is about the size of a milk gallon. So even though it's empty, it's just, you know, it's big. Or there's three things and she's only got two small hands. And so she's like, ah. And so she'd struggle and then she'd get to the door to the garage where the recycle's kept and, and she's like, what do, what do I do? And the logical, you just, you set it down, you open the door and then you pick it back up. But she, she thinks she has to kind of do it all. And, and so she, it was a struggle. It was just, if you've got young kids, you, can, you know, how much, like, it takes them a long time to just do anything, and the Lord teaches us patience and teaches us more patience. But this was, this was interesting. And so, uh, first few times she had trouble with it, but then, since then, she's, she's um, been really, really quick to ask mom and dad for help. And so, we'll tell her, hey, can you take out the recycle? And she'll say, sure. Will you help me? I'll say, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll help you. And so, we walk over there, and there's, like, I don't know, six or seven things, She'll pick up one in each hand, and then she'll be like, okay, can you also get the door? And so now I'm left with about six things in my arm, doing all the heavy lifting, and she's just walking with her two little things, 
to the garage, and then me, I'm either setting them down like a normal person or fighting with the door, doing that kind of grocery, grocery carry, get the door open, and we, we dump it all in the recycle can. But she is so quick to jump to the grace when she has to do the recycle. And I, and I don't think God looks at that, you know, making a parallel now, I'm not talking about Francis, talking about us. I don't think God looks at that and be like, well, you're big, you should do this yourself. You know, I don't care if it takes you 20 trips. But I think sometimes that's our view of God. Sometimes we, we find either ourselves feeling like we're not worth his help. We find ourselves feeling like we've not earned this grace. We find ourselves feeling like maybe this is just my lot, I have to do this. But I think God loves it. Just based on the way he rigged the game, I think he wants us to play Scrabble with him. I think he wants us to be like, Dad, can you do all the heavy lifting? I'm going to carry these two things. You know, we're like, she's not sitting on the couch being like, imagine, this is a totally different scenario. Imagine this. I say, Francis, you need to stop watching the TV and go take out the recycle. And she says, okay, Dad, will you do it for me? And I'm going to keep watching TV. I'd very quickly just like unplug the TV and be like, no, you're doing all the recycle. <laughs> but that's because of my humanity. But I think that God, God still wants to see us do something. I'm not saying that we just sit back and he does everything. If, if we look at the chart, there's still like an area where we have capability, but his grace covers all the difference. Whatever difference there is, he, he covers that. And it's because he, he loves us. So when we're in those moments and we think like, oh, I don't know if I can ask God to help me with this thing, you absolutely can. Even if your best is just carrying two cans and he's going to carry everything else, I think he loves it. I think he loves to partner with us. I think he loves to close the gap where we cannot do it. I think we give our best and we, you know, we give it a good college try, but, but he closes that gap. He does, the, he does all, all the difference. So now, we looked at the scriptures, but what about those moments in our life where, where God prompts us to do something? Prompts us to, to, to pray for someone at work? Prompts us to, you know, to pray for someone's hand to be healed. Prompts us to, to share Jesus with a neighbor. Prompts us to, to do these things. There is no amount of, of words that I could say that would transform someone's life from death to, to life. That would transform their, their soul from, from perishing to eternal life. There's no amount of words that I could do. But when I open my mouth and speak the words of the gospel... And his grace makes them born again. Right? Like that's a miracle. When, when I lay my hands on someone, it doesn't matter how sick or, or, or healthy they are, if I'm, if I'm wanting them to be healed, there is nothing I can do. I, I can jump up and down and I can get real excited and I can get super passionate and I can shout and I can yell. But if God's grace doesn't bring healing, they're not getting healed. Right? And, and so, even in a, in a message like this, I can study, I can pull scriptures, I can, I can, uh, I can pray on these things, I can, I can meditate on it, I can dive into the word, I can have other conversations, I can read commentaries. But if God's grace isn't on it, we were better off watching a TED Talk. They're probably more articulate, right? Like, so, so there is these things that we're seeing again and again in our life where whatever it is that he's called you to, parenting, your career, your place of influence in your neighborhood, um, the, the, the individuals that you meet at the store and, and the wait, waitresses or the waiters, each of those opportunities where he's prompting you to do something, it's an invitation to play Scrabble, and you can't play it without him. It, it's an invitation to join with him and to partner with him in a way that you have to have him to do it. Everything in your life that he's called you to, every prophetic word that he's given you, every, every uh, glimpse of the destiny that you're supposed to have, it's dependent on his grace. But his grace is so abounding. His grace is so available. Let's look at John chapter 15. We reference John 15 a lot because it's one of those things that I find myself drifting from. For one reason or another, I think that I do okay without God, and that's never the case. I always need more of God. But for some reason, I tend to find myself thinking, okay, God, you've got my eternity, 
you've got my salvation, you've got my soul, I'll take care of all the rest of this. And, you know, if you throw some blessings my way to make it easier, that's great. But I find myself almost wanting independence when God has designed from the beginning us to be dependent on him. John 15, picking it up in verse 4, Jesus is addressing his disciples and he says, Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It's that grace gap. He's acknowledging your best efforts, all of your works, only gets you halfway. He says, you can't do anything without me. The system is rigged. And I can say that with a smile because there's so much grace. We can't do anything without him. And yet with that, all fruit comes uh, from the branches. So you've never seen a tree trunk, like an apple tree trunk, that has just like apples on it. The apples always come from the branches. The tomatoes grow at the edge uh, of, the, of the branches. The grapes grow at the edge of the, of the branches. None of it comes from the vine, from the middle part, from the, the trunk. Even though that's what causes all the fruit to bear, God chooses to do it with us and through us. He doesn't do it apart from us. So if we don't, if we don't open our mouths, if we don't step out in boldness with a prayer, if, if we don't do those things, it doesn't happen because God has chosen it and he's designed it this way where he does it with us. But if we try to do it without him, it also doesn't happen. So it's only through a divine partnership. So we have to remain in him. We have to partner with God to close the grace gap. With that, we need bold humility. Bold humility. Humble in that we're recognizing we can't do it without him, but bold knowing that God generously gives us all the grace we need. So a bold humility. humility. It feels almost like an oxymoron where it's like, how can, you know, it seems like humble is almost timid and bold is almost arrogant, but it's not. Those are, those are different, similar but very different. I am bold because I know God has designed the system this way for me to cry out to him because he loves to close the gap, but humble knowing that if he doesn't, I can't do anything. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, for his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So Peter's praying. He wants grace and peace to be multiplied to them. But then he, he explains, you've already got it. It's already been granted to you. And it's come through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. John chapter 1 kind of hits it from a different way. It says, for from him, which is Christ, fullness, from his, Christ, from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. We've already got it. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So how do we have it? How have we received it? How has it already been granted to us? The true knowledge of knowing Jesus. It was through Jesus that all this grace has been poured out. In 1 Corinthians 1, it says this, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the embodiment of grace. So when we've asked him into our hearts and into our lives, and when he's, he's living in us and we're abiding in him, we have all the grace we need. There is no deficiency problem in Jesus. He, he doesn't have a grace deficiency. He doesn't run out. God is all sufficient. And this was a big epiphany moment for me this year. I used to think that God just had a lot of things. You know, like he, he has a lot of rooms in his house. So he doesn't, he doesn't run out of space when we go to heaven. 
it's not, it, I used to think he had a lot of resources, right? The, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and, and all of this is true. I used to think that he had a lot of, of patience, but it's not just that he has a lot of these resources, it's that he is sufficient in himself. That he doesn't, he doesn't have, he doesn't, um, how do you say this? God doesn't experience lack because he has a lot. He doesn't experience lack because he is incapable of lacking, right? Now that's, that's, it seems subtle and it seems almost like arguing like just on nuance, but it really begins to shift some things when you understand that it's not just that he has a lot so he can afford to give it out because it won't run low, right? Like a billionaire can make big donations and still not run out of money. A, a trillion dollars is unimaginable to me. Like, there's no way to, to spend that reasonably. Like, you can't just, like, there's no amount of groceries you could buy and ever run through trillions of dollars. God isn't like that. It's not just that he has a lot and our needs are small. It is that he does not experience lack because he is incapable of it. Everything that he needs, he is self-sufficient in. I need oxygen. I need water. I need food. God doesn't need anything. It's not just that he has a lot of it. He doesn't need anything. So there is never a grace deficiency in him. He's never run out of, out of grace to give it. Now, we can walk away from it, and we've talked about how, how salvation isn't a, uh, a prayer you pray once and then you're good. It's not fire insurance that, like, you paid for, and it's like, oh, I'm, I'm set now. Like, we understand that a relationship with God is a relationship. We have to walk with him. It's a marriage where the two of us are joined together. There's a covenant, but there's still a... a, a maintainment in that relationship. But the grace that we're talking about to close that gap, to partner with him, to do the things that he's called us to do, he never runs out of that grace. Jesus has more than enough of grace. And so when we put him in our hearts and when we partner our lives with him, we now have total access to what John 1 called grace upon grace. Grace on grace on grace. It's just, it's a layered cake of grace and every layer is more grace. That's what we have access to. In Titus chapter 2, it says this. It says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. Now, what do we know that to be? That's Jesus, right? What, what was revealed that had been hidden that brought salvation to all people? Jesus. For the grace of God has been revealed. Verse 12, And we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom and righteousness and devotion to God while we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. Amen. That stirs my heart, the looking forward with hope. Now, I know I've talked a lot about grace. I want to just pivot in these last, last bit. Uh, the looking forward with hope. I learned this year that, that Advent isn't just a fancy word for Christmas. I thought that it was. I grew up with an advent calendar, and I thought it was just like the chocolates in the boxes, and each day you'd open it up and you'd get another treat. I thought it was just a fancy word for Christmas. I thought it was the countdown. And as I was reading uh, this year, preparing my heart this, this season, I'm like, oh, it's Christmas. I want to think more about, about God and Jesus. I was doing some reading, and I understood that in, a, in different denominations, more sort of high church, more uh, liturgical, more kind of uh, formal they view Advent as having more to do with Christ's second coming than his first. And that was a surprise for me. I didn't think much of Christmas and the end of this age. I didn't think much of Christmas and trumpets and bowls. I didn't think much about Christmas and Jesus splitting the sky and riding on the clouds and, and coming back to conquer the earth and, and set up a, king, a, a very real kingdom. Those were two very different um, things in my mind. Because again, I'm thinking Advent is just chocolate calendars. And so as I was, as I was reading some of, some of what other denominations and, and other practices, how they view this season of December, is really touching my heart. It was very much this Titus passage of looking forward with hope to that wonderful day. And so I was beginning to, to find stirred up in my heart of like, God, would, would you come again? And, and recognizing how prophetic this season is, December, looking forward to Christmas, because it's the answer of all 
all the Old Testament that was pointing to Jesus, and it's us waiting in anticipation for the prophecies of his second coming. And so the Advent season, the Christmas season, is deeply prophetic. That, God, you have fulfilled so many prophecies in Christ's first coming, and you are still fulfilling prophecies as he prepares for his second coming. And so I was feeling stirred, like not only just the grace of God in the person of Jesus, but the grace of God in the person of Jesus who's coming back again. And then with that realization, when you, when you keep that in front of your mind, when you make, he is coming again, there's going to be a kingdom, we're going to live uh, eternally with him, when that is in front of your mind, it shifts how you live. When, and maybe this is, this is morbid, but when you're thinking about the end of your life, it shifts how you live it now, right? If, if I only ever just see today, then it's easy to lean into comforts and pleasures and to, to delay other stuff. But when I know my time is short, every opportunity with my family is important. When I know my time is short, uh, I shift my finances a certain way because I think, oh, like, I need to make sure that the next generation is taken care of. Like, I want, I want them to be set. I, I want to make my ceiling their floor. But without thinking that way, it's easy to just be like, ah, worked hard, I'm just going to kick back, I'm going to relax, I'm going to take the evening off, not really engage these things. And I think the same is true of our eternal life. The same is true of our, our Christian life, of our souls, that when we think and, and look forward with, with great hope and expectation for the second coming of God, it forces us to live differently. When we are living with, with an eternal mindset and with the kingdom of God at the forefront of our mind, not on the back burner, it changes how we interact with strangers. It changes what we do for the poor and the helpless. It changes what we do for the people in our community. When we're not living with that, it's easy to lose sight of those things. And so as I was thinking about Advent, thinking about not just a countdown to Christmas, but really preparing my heart to see God come again, it was, it was making me realize some of the areas in my life that, oh God, I want to change this. And so in the same way where how the secular world would view January as a great time to make New Year's resolutions and, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get fit, I'm going to get back on a budget, I'm going to do this, I'm going to improve. Advent is the Christian time where we should look and say, oh, Christ came and he's going to come again. And am I prepared? Jesus tells several parables about uh, watchful servants and good stewards and, and people that manage their time and their resources well, all with the implication of when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith like this? Will he find people watchful like this? Will he find people who are in the place of prayer like this? And so whether it's the verses or the parables that you find in the Gospels, we see that, that Jesus cared deeply about how our behavior was going to lead up to his return. That the, the, what we did with the time and the resources we have matters. That we have to give an account for how that is. And so I was touched that for Advent, it's, it's a time of, of recognizing his grace, how beautifully rich his love is for us, that he would send his son, that we have salvation, these beautiful songs about the newborn king. But it also made me think of, of, of my own heart, my own life, and how I, how I spend my time and my energy and my resources and the other thing that it, it caused me to think about and reflect on is the incredible patience of God. The incredible patience of God. Patience in his first coming. I don't understand everything, but it, it seemed like from the time the law was given with Moses to the time that Jesus came was, was quite a long time. Patience in his second coming. It's been almost 2,000 years and we haven't seen Jesus come back yet. He's patient. But then even patience in the way that Jesus came the first time. Think about this. You're shepherds. You're living in Bethlehem outside of Jerusalem. You're watching some sheep. It's a quiet night. And then, bam! The sky explodes open with angels singing and praising, and there's a declaration about a baby that's been born, and there's some strange astrological signs. There's a star out of nowhere that no one can explain where it came from. And then three decades of nothing. Right? Jesus is born as a baby. We're familiar with the nativity and the manger scene and Mary and Joseph. 
And then he doesn't begin public ministry until he's about 30. The patience of God to say, look, your, an- your prayers have been answered. The prophecies are fulfilled. And then 30 years of nothing. And I, and I was touched. I was like, God, how many times have you answered my prayer with a seed in the ground when I was, when I was praying for a, an apple tree? And you said, I'll, I'll plant this seed. Your prayers have been answered. And I said, God, I can't see it. It doesn't feel like it. Oh, but he's, he's patient. And he's not, he's not in a hurry. He's not concerned. He's not frantic. And sometimes in December, it's easy to get concerned and frantic, to lose sight of the God who holds the whole earth in his hands and isn't worried about anything. And his incredible patience that maybe our prayers are being answered in a process and not in a, in a moment. Maybe, maybe in the same way where he sent a son instead of a, a, a king, right? And not to say that Jesus wasn't a king as a baby, but, but a lot of the Jews at the time thought that they were going to get a conquering king, someone who was going to ride in on a horse and kick the Romans out. And instead they got a baby. And because it didn't look like they expected, they didn't know what to do with it. And so Advent reminds me to check my heart that God, when I pray for something and it comes differently than I expected, will I still praise you? Will I still honor you? Will I still celebrate you? Even if nothing unfolds for the next 30 years, will I still be faithful? I'm young. Maybe many of you have been waiting on a prayer for 30 years. And and the encouragement this morning is maybe... Maybe it's already been answered, but it looks very different. Maybe it's just coming to maturity. So I want to encourage you with the patience of God and with the grace of God. And I want to remind you that that though the the system might be rigged, uh, he gives us more than enough. He, He gives us more than enough grace. We've already received it. It's living in our heart. Its name is Jesus. And we have access to this. But that doesn't mean that everything's going to be instant. It doesn't mean that because I have this grace now, now I live in a microwave world where, where God's going to answer every prayer immediately and give me everything I've ever wanted. There might be a process. There might be maturing. There might be persevering. There might be testing. There might be trials. There might be difficulty. But through it all, God has given us more than enough grace to endure it well. I want to close with, with a couple of these prayers. My background, I, I grew up in a kind of church similar to The Rock, non-denominational, spirit-filled, Pentecostal. We got excited sometimes. We had a tambourine lady who would, who would dance. Uh, but we didn't, have, uh, we didn't have some of the traditions that, that other denominations have. And, and I think the beauty of, we talk about the church being the body of, of God and each of us play a different part, you know. I think it's Corinthians 12 and Romans, Romans 12, somewhere around there. They talk about the different parts of the body. And some of these other parts of the body, we don't always understand it because it feels too formulaic. It feels too ritual. It doesn't feel like, well, the Holy Spirit couldn't inspire that prayer because it was written so long ago. But I think there's something special about that. So I, I, I picked three prayers that came from a, an Advent guide I was going through that that come from either the, the Book of Common Prayer or, or revised um, lectures. And, and these, are, these are prayers that have been around for a long time. And, and although I, I had a grandfather who his prayer every day was always the same, and so our family kind of swung the opposite way on that because it seemed like it wasn't relationship, it just seemed like it was a password, you know, like the, the passcode you punch into your phone. That I was like, well, if I just say these words in this order, I'm set. And that's not, we know that's not it. We know that life with God is so much richer than that. But there's something neat about joining with people, not even in this moment, but joining with generations who have all prayed a similar thing. And as I prayed this, I I recognized even where my prayers, you know, as inspired as they may be, still fall short because I'm praying with selfish motives or I'm praying with immaturity or I'm praying with with something else. And so these time-tested prayers were an encouragement to me. And I Hope they're an encouragement with you. So would you just, um, 
I don't know, maybe heads bowed and eyes closed. This, this is just to give us a moment of, of reflection and introspection this so we aren't distracted. I want to just read th- three of these prayers over you and, and invite you to pray them with me. Unexpected God, your advent alarms us. Wake us from drowsy worship, from the sleep that neglects love and the sedative of misdirected frenzy. Awaken us now till your coming and bend our anger into your peace. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light now in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal. Through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. God of joy and exaltation, you strengthen what is weak. You enrich the poor and give hope to those who live in fear. Look upon our needs this day. Make us grateful for the good news of salvation and keep us faithful in your service until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives forever and ever. Amen. Would you stand with me? Father God, we lay our hearts bare before you this morning. Lord, where we've tried to do it in our own strength, Lord, we come with bold humility saying we need you to fill the gap. Lord, where we've been frustrated because the progress didn't come easy, because we were trying to do it in our own strength, Lord, we say we need your grace. Father God, we pray that where we've tried to do it on our own, Lord, you would encourage us with the person of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that you never run out of grace. Your arm isn't too short. Your ear isn't hard of hearing. You aren't deaf or blind. You you are right here with us. We have a high priest who can relate to us. And so, Lord, though the system is rigged, Lord, we celebrate that you have given us everything we need, grace upon grace. But, Lord, we pray that that grace would be multiplied, that what we've already been given, we pray that you'd give us even more. Father, whether whether that's been where our hearts are at this morning or whether we're, we're deeply aware of your grace at work in our life, but, Lord, we've lost sight of your second coming. Lord, we pray that we would use this as a season to reflect on how you came to earth, how you came to our hearts, and how you will come again. Lord, that as we fix that firmly in our mind, that you will come again. Someday you will split the skies and and come on the clouds with glory and the hosts of heavenly angels, the armies of God. And you will will remake everything on earth. You You will... redeem it back to yourself. Lord, that will be a real event. Father, I pray that we would fix it in our hearts to live like it's going to happen. Lord, that's not a fairy tale. It's, It's what you've promised. And every promise you make will happen. And so, Lord, as we wait for that day, we we choose to celebrate your patience instead of rebel against it. And so, Lord, where our prayers have seemingly been met with silence, Lord, we accept that that you are at work in a process. Lord, where our petitions seem like they haven't been answered, Lord, we choose to see the the seed in the ground that someday will be the tree of the answer of God. We, We choose to see the baby in the manger in the 30 years of silence before before the ministry began before he died on the cross. Lord, we we accept that not everything will happen on our timetable, but we give you permission to be God in our life and to do it at your speed, at your pace. 
And so we love you. We surrender to you and the way you've designed things patiently and with a gap that requires your involvement. Lord, we throw ourselves on your mercy and grace. We ask for more of it this morning. In Jesus' name. Just as we close, I'm just going to open up communion. And uh, Andrew said something. He said, Jesus is the embodiment of grace. And so just as we leave, uh, I know some of you may have to go. That's fine. But um, I just wanted to open this up. Greg, if you can just maybe just pull those open and open them up. And so I, we're, we're, we're going to just soft close. We're going to just open it up here and just... You just may want to take a moment just to, just with Jesus, here's the beauty of it. Is it this is the blood and it's the body of Christ. It's the grace that we have. It's like you're taking hold of this grace. Jesus is the embodiment. And there's a scripture. Uh, actually, I'm gonna, I'll just go to Hebrews 4. You don't have to turn there or anything. I'm just going to read it quickly. But it's so beautiful. It's Jesus, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And then he says this, So let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And I felt like just, it's like we're going to just approach the throne of grace. We're going to come and we're going to partake just of what he has for us, that we realize that we actually cannot do it alone. We need a savior. We need Jesus. We need the high priest. And he says, come to me, and I will give you rest. Yoke with me. Learn from me. So, Lord, we just thank you for today. We thank you for this message, this word. Let it go deep into our hearts. And, Lord, every time we take your body and your blood, that we would also realize that this is the grace of life that we must partake of if we are to have life, that we cannot do it without you. It's why you say, do it as often as you eat, as you drink, in remembrance of me. So Jesus, we just thank you for you. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you that we get to partake in you. We thank you that we get to be the branches and that you are the vine and that we have to be connected with you. And it's because of you that we can be fruitful that we can reveal and release the fruit, the very the glory of God on the face of the earth. You do it through your people. And so I just thank you for your blessing. Thank you for this word. May it go deep into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Love you. Uh, you're welcome to just come, take communion. Love on each other. Make sure you give someone a hug before you leave. Tell them to go in the grace of God.